What's up, you beautiful bastards? Hope you're having a fantastic Thursday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing that we're gonna talk about today is some online entertainment slash industry news that I'm knocking out first to answer the question of what the hell is up with your background? What, you didn't notice until just now when I mentioned it? I picked out the carpet myself, don't you love it? And I even had them install an awesome feature where the light randomly changes with out you wanting it to. I'm in a hotel because I'm at VidCon. It's actually my ninth VidCon, but it is my first VidCon since it was purchased by Viacom. If you're not familiar, fellow creators Hank and John Green started it all those years ago. They just recently sold it to Viacom. And it's going to be interesting to see what it's like, if anything has changed, but this will also be my last VidCon. And I don't want that to seem like a massive statement on my part. I've Yes, I've had differences with decisions that VidCon has made in the past. And in fact, they've been nothing but nice and accommodating to me. But as I think more and more creators are going to realize the, the, the ROI, the return on investment of your time just isn't necessarily there, unlike if you have your own events. And so while this will be my last time, that's because I want to focus on our own DeFranco Live events, something we used to do a while ago. It's something that I really, really loved because I, I just, I love being able to see people in real life. And that's why you're seeing some creators doing it, actually most notably Tana Mojo right now. And on the show, of course, you maybe remember that we, we've talked about Tana in the past for, for, for controversies and other situations, favorite controversy, probably the dubs one. But one of her most recent situations was her making this hour and a half video about how she had a horrible time at VidCon, she was mistreated by staff, she felt overall that the event was poorly run. And so this year she decided to take a huge swing and launch TanaCon. And it's not that she just launched her own event that makes this stand out. It starts tomorrow at the same time VidCon is happening. It is not only in Anaheim like VidCon, it is <laughs> it's taking place at the Anaheim Marriott Suites, which is so incredibly close. And reportedly there are already 80 confirmed creators to attend. And she has a solid range in addition to herself. You have Miranda Sings, Ricky Dillon, Shane Dawson, Casey Neistat, Bella Thorne. And so I am so fascinated to see how this goes. I'm a big fan of alternative events, anything that leads to more competition, maybe it's a different avenue. So whether it's something like a, a smaller, more niche thing or a direct competitor. I mean, VidCon this year is expected to have 30,000 people, but I think more and more you're gonna see things like a TanaCon pop up where people go, wouldn't it be more interesting if, if instead of all of these people, it could be one to 4,000 of a kind of more central. But also on the other end, with this being a test, there is the possibility that it becomes a complete shit show. And so that's also another reason I'm interested in it. But we'll see. Personally, I hope it does well because the success of others and people being more independent in this community leads to more success for others being independent in this community. But also a question I wanna pass off to you around a story like this. Do you, do you prefer it to be kind of two or three main events? Think of it along the lines of a, a Comic-Con. Or do you like to see these other things pop up where there's kind of just smaller groups, more possibility for interaction? I don't know, let me know what you're thinking in those comments down below. Also, where do you think that we should have our, our first set of live events? But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today, and today in Awesome, brought to you by movement.com slash D. And Movement, of course, is a fantastic watch and sunglass company for men and women. And for those of you that call out and compliment the watch that I have on in my shows, that is a Movement watch. They've got so many good looks and designs, and best of all, they start at just $95. Which is this very nice reprieve, because it feels like every time you go to a department store, you're just seeing $400, $500 price tags. Also, on top of that, it's completely risk-free. You have free shipping world, Worldwide, free returns worldwide. And best of all, when you decide to make the smart decision and go to movement.com slash D like so many others have, make sure you enter in code D, and they'll give you $15 off your first order today. And the first bit of awesome today is a little bit self-promo. If you are here at VidCon, you do want to see me. Here is my schedule. Also, if you're not here, but you want to be a part of today's Q&A, you can go to Twitter, use the hashtag VidConAskPhil, and ask me a question, we might answer it live. Then some lighter awesome, you had Fergie watching fan covers on YouTube, you had the stars of Marvel's Cloak and Dagger explaining how the show compares to the comics, smarter Every day gave us two vortex rings colliding in slow motion. Then we got a trailer for the new Steve Carell movie, Marwen. Netflix then gave us the date for Ozark season two, which it, I'm just gonna use this as an opportunity. If you have not watched Ozark, I highly recommend it. Um, the, there are lulls, but I will say the first episode and the last episode of the season are some of my favorite pieces of television. And if you wanna see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then let's talk about why Burger King is in the news. And if, if you've followed this show for a while, you no, it's not because I'm gonna be like, their sandwiches are dope. Ton of people are angry at Burger King this week because of an ad they put out in Russia. Also a note here, because there seems to be some confusion, Burger King Russia is actually owned by Burger Russ LLC, not the Burger King here in the United States. There is a difference there, or at least there should be a difference there, and unfortunately that has not been noted in a lot of places. But the ad that they posted online announced a contest. And they explained the rules, which were very simple, saying get pregnant by a player competing in the World Cup and receive three million rubles. 
that coming in at around 47,000 US dollars, and then of course a lifetime supply of Whoppers. And roughly translated, they say for these girls, it will be possible to get the best football genes and will lay down the success of the Russian national team on several generations ahead. Forward, we believe in you. And so big shocker, turns out a bunch of people had a problem with a company saying, hey, have sex with those athletes and bring a life in this world for a bunch of sandwiches. People instantly calling it sexist, misogynistic, others just saying it's flat out disgusting. Additionally, this ad most likely angered a Russian politician in particular, that being Tamara Pletnyova. She's a chairperson of the Duma Committee on Families, Women, and Children. She has said that Russian women should give birth to our own, adding these children then suffer and have suffered even from Soviet times. You know this perfectly well. It's fine if they're one race, but not if they're from a different race. I'm not a nationalist, but still. She was also referencing a problem Moscow faced following the 1980 Olympics where there was a large spike in pregnancies from foreign fathers, most of whom just left the country. And following all of that backlash, the company then removed the ad and apologized, saying we apologize for the statement we made. It turned out to be too insulting. Then thanking people for their feedback and saying we've removed all materials related to the ad. So that's that. Also, this really isn't a surprising situation if you look into Burger King Russia. Last year, they had an even worse controversy. It happened last year. They put out an ad on social media that had the likeness of a 17-year-old rape victim. The ad featured her clothing, the hairstyle she had when she appeared on a Russian talk show. Even her hand is making the same movement. And it's a still from when she was talking about when she was being raped and badly beaten. It was The whole incident was a massive deal in Russia at the time. And the ad is for a buy one burger, get one free ad, and it has her saying it won't last long. So I think if they got past that, they're definitely going to get past this. Then in news news, if you're an American watching this right now, two reports have just come out saying you do not trust the news. And specifically, these new reports from Gallup and Knight Foundation found that Americans believe 62% of the news on TV or the radio is biased and 44% is inaccurate. And on social media, it actually gets worse. Reportedly, people believe that 80% of news there is biased and 64% is inaccurate. And in the survey, they found that people rarely differentiated between bias and accuracy. So often, if a source was perceived as biased, it was also considered inaccurate. And the few exceptions they said they found were NBC, The Washington Post, and The New York Times. And as far as what people thought was least biased and most accurate, you had PBS, The Associated Press, and NPR. Additionally, along party lines, they found that people that were Democrats or at least leaned left trusted media more than people that were Republicans or leaned right. But that said, the further and further you look into it, it, you just see more and more people not believing information that they're seeing. But then at the same time, it might not be the most surprising thing because according to one of the reports, 83% of Americans, when they are uncertain about the facts of a story, they go to their main place. They go to the sources they use most often, which could just be regurgitating what they want to hear. Whereas only 58% said they go to a source with a different perspective than their own. But with all of that said about these reports, what I will say is I do not think that there is a way to fix this. According to 76% of those surveyed, they said it is on the shoulders of the social media companies to identify misinformation. But unfortunately for every individual, their perception is reality. Their feelings at times often become their truth. Obviously I'm taking a jump back here, but there was a 1991 poll in the United States that found 18% of Americans believed that the sun revolved around the earth. So then those 18% given the facts of the situation, how many of those people shout fake news? How many of those people say, ah, you're biased, you're just pushing your pro-earth going around the sun agenda? And I won't even touch a bunch of the other stupid bullshit that people have eaten up just because I I, I don't want to deal with that level of stupid today. With that said, these surveys got me thinking, and so I wanted to pass the question off to you. Who do you trust out there? Are you more trusting of what you see on TV versus something you see online? Why do you think that is? For the places you do trust, why? And also, do you ever consume news anywhere that may not have the same perspective as you? I'd love to know any and all of that in the comments down below. Then let's talk about the news this week that Canada is now the second country in the world to legalize nationwide recreational marijuana. They're Senate voting 52 to 29 to lift the ban on marijuana. And as far as the specifics on the legalization, the act legalizes possession of up to 30 grams of marijuana for Canadians who are at least 18 years old. Sales will occur both at retail locations and through the mail, although it is up to the individual provinces to set up their own distribution methods. And that's actually a key point because some provinces like Ontario are planning on having government run stores, whereas provinces like Alberta are going to issue licenses to private retailers. Each individual residence will also be able to grow for marijuana plants. There will also reportedly be strict standards as far as potency. And following the passage of this act, we heard from Justice Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould, who, who really talked about what this means for Canada. It leaves behind a failed model of prohibition, a model that has made organized crime rich and left our young people vulnerable. Most importantly, our shift in policy will protect youth from the health and safety risks of cannabis 
and keep those same criminals from profiting from its production, distribution, and sale. And it's also going to be interesting to see what kind of domestic impact this has on Canada. For example, according to Canada's Department of Justice, 58% of all drug offenses in Canada were related to cannabis. And so it's expected some provinces will issue retroactive pardons so these, these people may be released. It could affect the prison population. There's also the tax benefit. It's believed that in Canada, it could be a $4 billion industry. And as far as when legalization will become the new reality in Canada, Justin Trudeau has now announced that it is October 17th. And this is a constantly evolving topic. If you're a longtime viewer, you know that I have been pro-legalization for a very, very long time. This for a variety of reasons I will not bore you with once again. But I do want to pass a question off to you. What is your opinion on recreational legalization? Yes, it just makes sense. It hurts the drug dealers. It brings in new taxes that could be used on prevention programs. Or no, maybe you think it's a, it's a cash grab or it's a normalizing of a behavior or a thing that you think is horrible. I have mine, you have yours, and I'd love to hear it. We also now have have an update to the story around XXX Tentacion. This week we had of course talked about how the young rapper was murdered in Florida and the reaction after. And this morning we received new information thanks to the Broward County Sheriff's Office. Police had said they believed that he was killed during a random robbery. There were reports that X was planning to make a purchase at a motorsports shop. Reports saying that shortly before the shooting he had visited a bank so he might have taken money out. And this morning thanks to the Broward County Sheriff's Office we got the news that an arrest had been made. Authorities arresting this man 22 year old Dedrick Williams. He's reportedly of Pompano Beach and he was arrested shortly before 7 p.m. last night following a traffic stop. And he has now been charged with first degree murder without premeditation, violation of probation, and driving without a valid license. And currently he is being held in Broward County Jail. But even with his arrest, it is not over. Police saying they are seeking additional suspects and that the investigation is ongoing. And the last thing we'll talk about today are some side stories and updates to the constant that we've had this week, which is the child separation story at the board. And if you haven't seen the previous videos this week, I highly recommend watching those first. There's been so much to point out, explain, compare, Pair, contrast, filter through the fake news. But the first thing with this specific situation that I wanted to mention was Peter Fonda. Yesterday, Peter accomplished something that I thought had to be pretty much impossible, but of course, stupid always finds a way. He lost the moral high ground while being on the side of the debate that was saying that ripping children from their families is wrong. Because the way he expressed his point of view was to tweet in all caps, we should rip Baron Trump from his mother's arms and put him in a cage with pedophiles and see if mother will stand up against the giant asshole she is married to. And to that, I say to Peter Fonda and anyone else with such a limited IQ, here's a little pro tip. In a debate, you do not win points by saying that the person you don't agree with should have their child stripped away and put in a cage with a pedophile that's going to sexually assault them. This is just another example of it doesn't matter if you're on the right side of things if you say those things like an asshole. So ultimately what it looks like here is we just see a sick, sick tweet from a disgusting and disturbed man. So there was that, but then on the other side of this story, well, what about what's happening at the border? Yesterday, Trump signed that executive order while saying that zero tolerance policy is remaining the same. You mentioned the potential pitfalls that the Trump administration might fall into, much like the Obama administration did with expediting family cases. There have also been a lot of question marks regarding the children who have already been separated from their families. Also for the families that are kept together, what happens after they reach that 20 day mark, which is of course important because of the Flores agreement. Well, one of the newest pieces of information to come out is also confusing. Washington Post put out a piece today stating that the Trump administration was suspending prosecutions for parents of migrant children. But then they later updated that article specifically pointing out that it was actually the Customs and Border Patrol that would no longer be referring parents of migrant children for prosecution. In the article, a senior U.S. Customs Border Patrol official told them that the U.S. Border Patrol will no longer refer migrant parents who cross into the United States illegally with children to federal courthouses to face criminal charges. And so if that turns out to be true, that would be a massive about face because that really doesn't line up with a zero tolerance policy. And in fact, a Justice Department spokesperson has denied any changes to the zero tolerance policy, adding that prosecutions would continue. But part of the reason for the confusion here might be because of the separation of responsibilities. While the Justice Department is saying that prosecutions will continue to be prosecuted, the U.S. Border Patrol is responsible in the first place to refer migrants for criminal charges. And that official also reportedly said, we're suspending prosecutions of adults who are members of family units until ICE can accelerate resource capability to allow us to maintain custody. Also, we got insight as far as how the Justice Department plans to get past the limitations of the Flores Agreement, specifically the 20-day limitation. And that's because in a court filing, the Justice Department requested that a federal judge grant limited emergency relief to allow the Department of Homeland Security to detain migrant children in immigration and customs enforcement facilities while their parents are being prosecuted. But then at the same time, NBC News is reporting today that the government has dropped charges against 17 migrants, and that is exceptionally notable because reportedly each of those people are parents. And we also had Donald Trump today saying that he was directing government agencies to reunite the thousands of children and parents detained before Wednesday's announcement. But also at that time, he did not clarify how that would be done. And so hopefully that helps you see why it's so confusing right now. So as far as what we're going to actually see over the next 
next 24 to 72 hours. That, that is a bit confusing right now. And with this still being a developing situation, ultimately we're going to have to wait to see what actually happens. And that's where I'm going to end today's show. And of course, remember, this is the Philip DeFranco show. It is not just a show. It is a conversation. So whether it be the last story, the first one, anything in between, let me know what you're thinking in those comments down below. Also, remember, if you like this video, what I'm trying to do with this channel, hit that like button. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. Also, if you missed yesterday's Philip DeFranco show, you want to catch up, you can click or tap right there to watch that. Or maybe you need something a little bit lighter in your life, you can watch the newest behind the scenes vlog here. But that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow, most likely in a live stream.